Um, oh, wait. oh, perfect, perfect. I started. Uh, well, first of all, um, I'm, I'm very happy to welcome today uh, Tamara Adrian. Tamara Adrian is a famous uh, activist, LGBT uh, plus activist, but she's also an MP in Venezuela. And uh, even more importantly, today, uh, she's the co-chair of the International Day Against Homophobia, Transphobia, and Biphobia. Uh, so Tamara, first, before we start talking a little bit about Ida Obi this year, I would love if you could introduce yourself and talk a little bit about, uh, about uh, what brought you to, uh, to this leadership position in Venezuela and, and your experience. Well, uh, well, uh, as you say, I'm Tamara Adriana. I was the very first uh, trans people elected in, in, for a parliament in the uh, Western Hemisphere back in 2015. Uh, I've been involved in the fight for equal rights um, at the international level for many, many years now, since 2002, if I recall well, or 2003. Uh, we started to push forward for the recognition of um, LGTBI issues at the level of the UN, at the level of the OAS. And um, in this uh, parkour, I have been able to deal with um, uh, WHO, with uh, ACNUR, I mean, with different organisms of uh, UN, and of course, with uh, OES too. And uh, um, I've been the uh, co-chair for, for uh, Idaho T. Uh, well, actually, I, when I, I began to be the, the, um, the, the co-chair, I, I was, it was the time of Idaho, uh, International Day Against Homophobia, and then we introduced transphobia, and then we introduced biphobia, and then we introduced intersexophobia uh, in order to, uh, at the request of groups. I mean, it was not an initiative of, uh, um, of, the, of the chair, but uh, basically it was the request of groups that um, uh, were engaged in the fight of those identities in the case of trans, in the case of uh, bisexual people, and in the case of intersex, as uh, we respect that uh, every group has to have uh, uh, the, their own voice and, and, and have the possibility of express themselves within the context of their identities. And then this year we came with this uh, crazy idea that has not been um, placed in thought completely, is that uh, as um, 17 May uh, was the day uh, in which, uh, in, back in 1989, the uh, WHO decriminalize homosexuality and seven days later back in 2019 it was the day in which um, uh, the same occurred to trans uh, uh, and transsexuality um, to to have not a day but a week we haven't implemented this but i think uh, instead of a day to have a week or 10 days of celebration and commemoration will be a possibility that would uh, uh, allow much more um, pressure on the media, much more activities, and uh, perhaps much more conscience um, on people about uh, the need to change um, the, um, the minds and the hearts of the people. Yesterday I posted a tweet in which I say, basically in Spanish, I say thank you to all those who posted uh, hate uh, messages because they show how needed it is uh, this day and uh, how important it is to change minds and hearts. Yeah, so Tamara, one of the things that you point out is that there are more and more uh, countries that have activities around uh, the International Day Against Homophobia, Transphobia and Biphobia. You, you know, we have also seen that many, uh, the European Union and many countries officially recognize uh, this International Day. You know, one of the things that, that I would love to hear from you is why do you think it's important that LGBT people have one day where they can, uh, where they can both celebrate and commemorate their, their journey? Why, why, why in your opinion, uh, is it an important day? 
Uh, it is an important day because it's a day of visibility and it's a day of social fight. I mean, uh, the oppression against LGBTI people, it's uh, the norm in the world and it continues to be the norm, at least the social norm, even in countries which equal rights, in which equal rights have been achieved. Because uh, the change of mind is, is much, in general, is more, much more slower than the change of the law. Uh, although the change of the law is the prerequisite in order to get equality, equality on the facts. And let's just take, uh, for example, what is happening with uh, women's rights in this moment of confinement and how it has affected uh, their rights in, uh, and have created uh, a higher, um, higher rate of uh, violence and has been recorded by the denouncers that have been made uh, around the world. And um, uh, that means that uh, in most of the countries, although 27 countries do not allow women to have equal rights than men in this moment, uh, but in general, uh, most of the countries have equal rights. It's, this is not the guarantee of uh, an equal treatment. And uh, I think the, the, uh, the same uh, would happen with equal rights for LGBTI people in those countries in which equal right has been achieved, uh, a change from the legal point of view, it's uh, the origin of a social change, but this social change might take a longer time than we expect. Well, well I love this, you know, you, you're pointing out that even though there has been tremendous progress in Latin America, but also in the United States and part of Europe, we still have a very long way to go and you're pointing out that you know, we, we are targeting both legal changes and hearts and mind changes. Um, as you know, Tamara, I work a lot with private companies to try basically to leverage their power to contribute to social change. What do you think can be the role of the private sector in, uh, in helping the legal and social changes that you're describing? I think the role of uh, the private sector is indispensable in order to change also the situation. Uh, sometimes uh, they need for a little bit of a encouragement for engage into this, uh, into this change. And we then notice how many companies are now of the um, uh, 500 uh, uh, most important companies are now engaged into, into equality, but some of them are not. So, uh, in, in some cases, uh, we have to show how important it is for productivity and uh, how uh, that impact negatively to, to not be engaged into equality for those companies are, are not. And uh, that could uh, provoke a change in those companies that are not engaged in, in, into equality. And, uh, but then let's not forget that uh, besides um, the, the top 500 companies around the world, we have hundreds of thousands and hundreds of thousands or millions of um, small companies or even family companies that um, would have also uh, to, to, take, um, to take notice of this, this um, how this, um, often is to, uh, to uh, equality increments their productivity and also increments the ability for people to um, feel well within those, uh, those work centers and uh, promotes then productivity and increase their income. Well, I, I love this. And I think, you know, I completely agree with you, that, which is that today the, the, the role of the most progressive companies to bring along with them the smaller companies that don't even have on their radar screen the human rights of LGBT uh, people. And, and I think that the next step is to go beyond the walls of your company and try to bring in other smaller, maybe, or other more conservative companies on the same journey that you, you've been on. Uh, so Tamara, one question that I have is that 
the theme of uh, yesterday, the International Day, uh, but also, you know, as you mentioned, it's kind of a celebration all of this week, is breaking the silence. Uh, why breaking the silence and what does breaking the silence mean? As, as you know, every year we, uh, the, uh, the, uh, um, uh, at the level of the committee, we try to uh, vote for a theme uh, for the year in order to encourage people to encompass the day with a new perspective. In the past years, we have been centered into education, into inclusion of children, um, elder people. And this year, we, we choose to uh, break the silence uh, because um, it was uh, chosen long before uh, COVID uh, pandemics uh, uh, start. But uh, it, it also was a good, good opportunity uh, to uh, see how the um, COVID pandemics is affecting uh, disproportionately and differentiately uh, LGBTI people in their access uh, to health care in the one hand, uh, in their um, uh, situation within the families because many people have had to come back to, to their families uh, where they are not well received or they are um, getting uh, bad treatments and, uh, and for those who are confined because they, 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 they are um, they are now COVID positive and they, they have to, to be isolated or they are in, in, in some places where they, they stay with other people that are, have the COVID, uh, how they are treated and how they are sometimes not respected in their uh, gender identities or uh, sexual orientations. Yeah, and that, you know, I love the fact that, that you mentioned that because as, as, as we know, as we both know, being LGBT, very often the homophobia and the transphobia starts at home, meaning within the family is where sometimes the worst of uh, homophobia and transphobia can be. And so lo a lot of young people are trapped in their home uh, with people that might not be supportive of their sexual orientation or gender identity. You know, uh, last year I did a uh, survey about uh, LGBTI people living in Venezuela and li LGBTI Venezuelans living abroad to comparate their situation. And uh, the result, one of the, the most compelling um, findings of this, um, of this research was that in, in the case of families, the main aggressor was the mother. And it was by, by long, in most of the cases, the the most uh, the, the 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 person that uh, was most aggressive against LGBTI people within the families. That it was it was a finding that was very very hard for me to to process. And then I understood that uh, sometimes women um, are facing a kind of um, Estocolm syndrome, and they are at the same time they they are preserving preserving. Uh, they, they are subject to the patriarchal system, patriarchal system and at the same time they protect it. Real, uh, yeah, that's a very good point. Um, well, listen, Dama, I imagine you are in high demand today, so I'm not going to take too much of your time. So my last question to you um, will be, how are you uh, commemorating Ida? Or, you know, what are you doing this, this few days? Are you, are you doing a lot of, uh, of uh, social media? Uh, you know, how are you marking the International Day? against homophobia, transphobia, and biphobia? Yes, well, social media in these days of, of confinement are the, the way to communicate. Then I have had a lot of Zooms and a lot of, of other uh, life um, um, via um, uh, Instagram. And, and uh, I've been uh, uh, producing some, some uh, videos uh, including one with the MPs, other MPs, me and other MPs of the National Assembly uh, calling for equality. And I am promoting an agreement of the National Assembly um, recommending to, um, to take care of LGBTI people within the, uh, within the COVID and to document the uh, those violations of human rights that might occur during the COVID pandemics. 
Well, thank you so much, Tamara. You are a great inspiration. I think the first time we met uh, was when you came to the World Bank to advocate for the World Bank to take in consideration the development needs of LGBT people. Uh, it's been a pleasure working with you. Now we are together on the committee uh, of IDAOT, and I'm, I'm, I'm so happy to work under your chairmanship. And uh, thank you so much for being very generous with your time. And I hope I see you, uh, I see you soon. And happy uh, IDAOT uh, to you. Thank you, likewise. And I hope to see you soon in person. Yeah, great. Thank you. Ciao. Bye.